first off, let me say, Corey is a torch, right? He is a torch, <laughs> a voice, a man that is alive and on fire. He is burning. Uh, we are grateful to God um, that he would come and be with us and that he would come and minister the word of the Lord tonight. Whether you've listened to his messages or grabbed any of his books, I know that he and Billy together have the podcast, Gripped, which Billy is here as well, uh, which is amazing. Um, so I'm just going to ask you, I, I'm going to get out of the way. Corey, be totally yourself and be as free as you can be. Um, would you stand up with me real quick and help me welcome Corey Russell tonight? <laughs> Bro, we love you. We honor you. Love you, love you. Thank you, man. Amen, amen. Grab a seat. My goodness, that worship was amazing. Give them a hand. That was beautiful. It's an honor to be with you guys. I was just with Michael and the crew, the Burning Ones crew, last month in Chicago. We had a blast there, and it's an honor to be here. I think this is my very first time to Milwaukee area, so love it, man. Sweet, I love it, and just driving around today and got to see the Deer District and all that kind of stuff, so I'm happy for you guys, man. It makes me happy when we see uh, other teams winning NBA Finals, and uh, I'm just happy for you guys. I was very happy. <laughs> I think it's, it's short-lived. That season's over, um, <laughs> I think, but, but that's a whole other point. Anyway, I don't want to rain on your, I love it, man, I, that was the first place I wanted to go was go over there and, anyway, so, um, yeah, it's an honor to be with you guys, I'm a, um, I, I just, so many friends and again, just love it, me and Billy have been hanging out a lot and uh, I'm, I spent 18 years in Kansas City and uh, part of the International House of Prayer and uh, running there and then three years, coming on three years ago, we moved to Dallas, Texas, where we're now part of the upper room. And uh, just serving there and serving in the house there. Many of you might have heard their songs. And, and so it's a sweet thing and uh, what God's doing there. Um, been married 23 years. My beautiful wife, Dana. I have a 21-year-old daughter, 18-year-old daughter, and 11-year-old daughter. And so pray for me, all these women in my life. I don't know exactly what to say next. Pray for me. Just, just pray, pray for your brother. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I'm just, I, I'm just consumed with being a man of prayer, and I wanna, uh, I wanna be a man of prayer, and uh, and I wanna preach on prayer, write on prayer, and awaken prayer in this generation. Uh, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Psalm one. Uh, I wanna talk on Psalm one and two tonight. Psalm one and two, and uh, I just so feel kindred spirit with everything that. This crew, readying the bride, the burning one's crew, and uh, is about. Lord, we love you so much, and we ask you to release the fire of the Holy Spirit right now. I pray for a quickening to our hearts. God, I pray for a quickening to our spirits. I pray for that spirit of burning to rest upon us. I pray for the spirit of revelation to rest upon us. God, we need more than inner, just excitement and uh, just energy. God, we want divine power, divine awakening. God, come and help us and ready the bride in the name of Jesus. Amen. I, I really believe Psalm 1 and 2, and, and I think Psalm 2 is the, 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 the climax of it, but you can't really understand Psalm 2. I believe Psalm 1 is the answer of how to prepare for a Psalm 2 crisis. Psalm 2 is, I would say, maybe the... 12 most prophetic verses in the Bible of where we're at right now and where the earth is moving into. But I believe that Psalm 1 is the way that you can come out of the Psalm 2 rage. I believe that the way that we're going to come out of the Psalm 2 rage, chaos, and confusion is by embracing a Psalm 1 life of meditation. Everybody look at and just say the word blessed. Blessed. It's the first words out of the psalmist's mouth. He says, blessed or happy, the enviable life, blessed is the man. 
Blessed is the woman, blessed is the young, the old, blessed is the person who does not do something. All right? Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. I want you to see the three realities right there, walking, standing, sitting. I want you to see the slow progression of the human heart that whatever you're casually walking with today and whatever counsel that you're casually flirting with or allowing through your ear gates and your eye gates into your heart, whether it be through television, social media, conversations, people that are moving in a different direction, whatever you're casually walking with in this season, the slow progression of the heart is whatever you're walking with today, you'll be standing in agreement with the next day. And by the third day, you'll be sitting in the seat of the mocker, the seat of the scornful. And I believe if anything happened in 2020, I believe the church got exposed in what we've been walking with, standing with, and sitting in. And I believe there's been a lot of counsel of the ungodly that has gotten into the church, gotten into our souls, gotten into our perspectives and our minds. And I believe that we must break from this cycle because information is not neutral. Information isn't neutral. It's not like, well, it's not that big of a deal. Friends, this is an hour, and he was just talking about this is an hour to jealously guard the interior real estate of our souls. This is an hour to take heed what you hear, what Jesus said, and take heed how you hear. It's what Jesus spoke about in regards to the parables. Take heed what you hear and take heed how you hear. And the psalmist says, blessed is the man who does not walk, stand, or sit. But look at this. But his delight. Everybody say delight. Delight. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He says, I want to deliver you generation from a demonic process and bring you into a godly process of transformation. Here's my opening question for you tonight. Do you delight in the Word of God? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. No, no. For real. Go home. Talk to Jesus about this. Is it your number one source of entertainment? Is it what you do when you need a break? Is it what you do when you need to chill out? I understand. I I love football. I love things like that. But is is there something? Have you broken through into the love affair with the Word of God? I believe that the most prophetic thing that the church can be about in this hour is having is breaking through the peripheral and breaking into a fascinating love affair and delight in the Word of God. Do you delight in the Word of God? Is it your number one source of joy? Is it your number one source of comfort? Is it your number one source of counsel? Is it your number one source of joy? Is it? I know we know it. But I'm afraid at the end of the day, we have lots of pep rallies, and it's not translating into realities at home and in communities of people that are sitting before the Word of God and getting the Word of God, breaking past peripheral into an abiding reality in our souls. We're not going to get this at a McDonald's drive through You're not going to get this by an impartation surface. You're not going to get it to a fire tunnel, though I want all those things. But if the fire tunnel doesn't break a funk off of you for you to break through into delight, it was a pep rally. What impartations do, they give you about two weeks to make new decisions. And if you don't do anything and it lives in Memoryville, and man, you got to listen to that, and it doesn't translate into reality, it's a memory. God wants to shift the church into reality. We are guilty of superficiality in the church. We are guilty of superficiality, having the name that we're alive but dead, having lots of big words. We have come up with all the words that express fire and glory and 
liquid fire and glory and so many words. We've lost the value of words. Because we can say it, we deceive ourselves into thinking we believe it. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. His delight is in the law of the Lord. I'm praying for a Psalm 119 love affair for a generation. I want to invite you into a journey of going on the journey of breaking through your boredom. I want to say something to you. The Word of God is not boring. You are. I'm tired of putting God on trial like it needs to do something special to get this generation. we got to dress him up, make him a little bit more appealing to touch this wild generation. He has stunned creatures with the same word forever. They've never gotten used to him, not once. He's not the one on trial. We are. We're the ones that are so addicted to so much candy, we have no appetite for real pleasure and real food. We're the ones that have grown up on Skittles that we don't even know what to do with a real steak. And God wants to deliver us from superficiality, plastic Christianity, shallow Christianity, comparing ourselves by ourselves, and beginning to break through the pages and encounter the man on the other side of the pages. There is a man on the other side of these pages. The words bring you to Him. The words bring you to Him. They are the doorway. They are the entrance point into a man who is the Word. Who is the Word? It's His very name. And we dance around this fire. We'll use buzzwords. We'll get them on our t-shirts. But we never sat long enough to break through the plastic into reality. Do you delight in the Word of God? I want to. I get it and then I lose it. Then I get it again and I want to hold on to it. Guys, I want to tell you there is nothing more powerful and more valuable in this hour than a burning heart in the Word of God. We need a generation on the road to Emmaus. Jesus shows up with the two on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24, walks with them while they're sad. They were disciples and they were hoping that Jesus was the Messiah they were hoping for. And they were sad and Jesus walks with them and takes them on a guided Bible study from Genesis to Malachi, revealing how he must suffer and then enter into his glory. He gets to a fork in the road and says, see you later. And they go, "Huh, uh They constrained him. See, that's another point about revelation right there. Most of us get touched at church or at the conference, and we go, thank you, Jesus. Jesus will give you a little bit, and he'll see if that fulfills you or if it awakens a deeper hunger. Because he will give you a little bit and say, see ya. And most of us are good. See you next week, Jesus. But they constrained him. When God gives you a little bit, that's when you move into spiritual hunger, and you lay hold of him saying, I want to enter into a full encounter of what I've been touching. But most of us, our appetites are very small. We're broken up into a thousand pieces in our life. They constrained him. He comes in, sits at the table, breaks the bread. They still don't know him. Their eyes are restrained. He breaks the bread, hands it to him, and they begin to know, oh my goodness, it's him. And as soon as they know it's him, he vanishes. How many people have seen someone vanish right in front of you? Anybody in here? I'm not talking about old hippie days. Now, come on. <laughs> You're like, I saw him. He just vanished right in front of me. I ain't talking about them days. If, if me and you were sitting with a guy and he vanished right in front of us, you know what I'd do? I'd look at you and go, did you see the guy vanish? That would be what I'd say. That would what would steal my attention. These Jesus vanishes and they look at each other and they both go back to what they were feeling earlier in the day 
when they were walking on that road. And they said, did not our hearts... While he unfolded the scriptures to us, more powerful to them, more powerful than a vanishing man, is a burning heart when Jesus is leading the Bible study. And Jesus was walking them through Genesis and Leviticus and setting their hearts on fire. He wants to set the church's heart on fire in the Bible. He wants to inflame your heart of seeing Jesus in Genesis, of seeing Jesus in Exodus, of seeing Jesus in Joshua, seeing Jesus in the Psalms. He wants to inflame you and awaken you and deliver you from a Netflix binge generation and reorient your appetites, reorient your pursuits, reorient your vision. To a world that we are completely ignorant about, yet we know all the buzzwords. There's a world right here, friend. And God loves to take the most distracted, confused, the ADD to the 10th level generation, all the people with I'm not that smart, He's going to take folk like us and inflame our hearts in the Bible. He's going to inflame our minds. He's going to inflame our hearts. He's going to take simple people. Psalm 119 talks about you make the simple wise. I have more understanding than all my teachers because your word's my, my meditation. He's going to take folk like us and inflame our hearts and inflame our minds. Meditating in His law day and night. Pondering while speaking to oneself. Here's the point of the Bible. It's got to get off the page and get into your mouth back to Jesus. The words that transform you the most are not mine or any preacher you hear this weekend. They are your own when talking to Jesus. Meditating in His law day and night. The fourfold blessing to the person that does this. Are y'all with me? Because I'll get you up and we'll pray in tongues for 45 minutes. I'm serious. I'm not going to entertain you. <laughs> fourfold blessing. Number one, he shall be like a tree planted by rivers. Y'all better wake up. Start leaning in on it. Pray in the Spirit. I don't care. Do jumping jacks. Whatever you got to do. But lean in on it. He shall be like a tree planted by rivers of water. Right now we need trees in the body of Christ. Not conspiracy theorists. We need trees. Not conspiracy theorists. Well, it's not a conspiracy. But yes, yes, just get out of it. Shut it off. No, no, you're, we're so ingrained, we don't even know what I'm saying. It's so much a part of, it's all gotten so interconnected in our souls. That's why we need the Word of God to divide soul from spirit. Because there's such a connection between the soul and the spirit, we don't even know how to separate anymore. Jeremiah 17, pulling on Psalm 1, talks about the deceitfulness of the heart. And how entrenched it gets and we never even know it. And I believe the church is getting a full-on exposing of it. In this hour, he shall be like a tree planted by rivers of water. We need trees of stability. Trees that aren't shaken by every wind of doctrine. Every conspiracy theorist. Every new idea. Ever who, whatever's happening. Their lives aren't shaken by whoever is in the White House or who's not in the White House. Or whatever's happening or not happening, they're trees. They ain't going anywhere because they've broken through the surface of plastic 
fair weather trees and they've broken through, listen, and they've tapped into the underground sources of the Holy Spirit. They've broken through and planted by rivers of water. Which means this, they derive their source not from outside realities, but from under the ground. The hidden realities. They're drawing from another source. Not what Fox tells them. Not what Twitter tells them. Not what their neighbor tells them. They derive their source from the Word of God and from the Holy Spirit. Therefore, there's peace, there's stability, there's clarity above the storm. And above the fray. Friend, we've got to break through. We've got to shut off and break through. Jesus. No, no. He shall be like a tree. He will bring forth his fruit in its season. It literally means in every season. Thriving in every season. Number three, his leaf will not wither and whatever he does shall prosper. Isn't that interesting? We love that verse. Most of us spend the majority of our Christian lives trying to get God to bless dreams he never, he never authored on the inside of us. We'll try to talk God and then when you get mad at him because he's not your little butler running around fulfilling your dreams. That's why a life before the word of God delivers you from you adding Jesus onto your little calling and destiny and it puts you before his word where his will and his words and his dreams begin to impregnate you and they begin to fill you and God begins to birth his dreams through you and God co-signs those checks. Those are the dreams he blesses are the dreams that began with him. Whatever he does shall prosper. I'm tired of trying to talk God into my dreams. I want to get filled with his. Jesus is not a stepladder into your destiny. He wants to kill your destiny. Let me make it clear. He wants to kill it. So he can resurrect his through you. 20 year olds, hear me. I'll save you a lot of disillusionment. Whatever he does shall prosper. Well, friend, if we, and, and this, right now, we're at a 2.0 on the treadmill. I want you to understand 2020, we're never going back. I rebuke that. You can try to rebuke it all day. The earth is being prepared for the coming of the king. Create, creation's groaning. That's awesome and that's terrifying. That's awesome and that's terrifying. Because we are presently not prepared interiorly for what is coming upon the earth exteriorly. Luke 21 talks about hearts fainting from fear because of the expectation of the things that are coming upon the earth. And if we do not learn how to build within and build inside a vibrant life in the Word and the Holy Spirit, a flowing heart that doesn't derive its perspective from Fox, but from the Word of God. We are moving into a Psalm 2 generation. It's, we're at a 2.0 right now. And if we're worn out at a 2.0, there's an 8.0 that's coming. The, the, the tide, the pressure is coming to increase. And if you're worn out now, it's even more high time to get delivered from the false sources and break through into a living source that delivers you from doing Christianity in your own wisdom, strength, and resources and breaks you into divine power and divine resource. It's not about the strong surviving. It's about the ones that get delivered from doing Christianity in their own strength and wisdom. The quickest. If we don't learn and come out of the Psalm 1 counsel of the ungodly, we're going to find ourselves in the Psalm 2 rage, chaos, and confusion. You're either going to find the Word of God as the loving boundary lines in which you experience pleasure, or you'll see them as bonds and cords that restrict your pleasure. David in Psalm 2 is in a full-on vision. David had many visions, 
And this is one of those visions that I believe are ultimately set apart for the days that we're moving into. It starts off with the question, why? You can see Psalm 2 like a four-part drama. Each scene of the drama has three verses. There's four main actors in the drama. The first one are the nations and the kings of the earth. It's the spirit of all the nations. Number two, you're going to see the Father. Number three, you're going to see the church and the, Jesus and the church, his people. And the fourth, you're going to see the prophetic messengers shouting to the earth. David asked the question, why? Are y'all with me? Or do y'all want to have an altar call and we just call it? I'm serious. I, I want to be taught, I want you to lean in on this. Why? Which means what he's seeing doesn't make sense. What he's seeing doesn't make sense. It's not going to work. It's vanity. And he says, why do nations rage? I want you to think about the word rage. That's going to be a word that's going to increasingly become more relevant as we approach the coming of the Lord. That word of rage, Revelation 12 talks about the devil having great rage because he knows his time is short. Rage is, is what fills the devil and his horde and it's going to fill the nations of the earth. Why do nations rage? And this is so interesting. And the people's plot, that word plot is the same word for meditate. So you're either going to get into a godly meditation or a demonic meditation. You're either going to get into a godly communion and process that's going to fill your mind and your soul. Or you're going to get into a demonic process that's going to fill your soul. And it's going to fill you with fear and anxiety and torment. And I better move my money because the stock market's going down. And I better do this and I better do that. And he says... Why do nations rage? Why do people's plot, that word plot is meditate, meditating a vain thing. And then he sees the kings of the earth and the rulers taking counsel together. David sees backroom meetings. He sees kings who are never on the same page, all of them on the same page. Most of them are temporary unities, but we see a demonic unity coming to the earth, a demonic unity in backroom meetings as they're beginning to align themselves around the same common goal. He sees kings, he sees rulers, judges, you can put in billionaires, players of nations, influencers, taking counsel together and look at who they're declaring war against, against the Lord and against his anointed. And this is what they're saying. Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. It's time to get rid of the old God and the old book. It's time to throw off the restrictions to our freedoms, the restrictions to how we want to define our own truth, and it's time we remove God's laws, God's standards, God's divine plumb lines from the creation, and it's time we remove Him out and we define truth as we see it. And David's screaming at the television, don't do it! I literally pictured David, first three verses, flipping through the channels, watching chaos like we've seen for the last two years, saying, no! It ain't going to happen. It's vanity. You're building a sandcastle. There's a wave coming. You can plot, you can get every demon, you can get all the money in the world, get all the kings of the world, get all the demonic power in the world, but it's vanity. But I picture David watching it, and God wants us to feel it at this level, but we don't engage in the battle from this level. Our weapon is not, or our war is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, rulers of darkness. The scene closes as the nations are shouting, let's get delivered from God. Let's get delivered from God's ultimate 
desire because, guys, I want you to know that the beginning of this Antichrist spirit has begun in the nations, but it's only going to culminate as we see the nations of the earth, the kings of the earth, the devils of the earth plotting and scheming over God's promised land, God's promised people, and a specific plot of land from where the Father has promised that Jesus is going to rule all nations from. This is about land. This is about inheritance. This is about promise. Zechariah 12 and Zechariah 14 are very clear about what this is going to look like before the coming of the Lord as all nations are surrounding Jerusalem. And David is seeing these days in full things. We're at the beginning of that generation. This is where it's going. He wants us to understand where this is going. So that we can get filled with the Father's confidence. Look at verse 4. It says, he who sits in the heavens. Everybody say, in the heavens. This is where we engage in the battle. This is where we engage in the battle. You don't do it from barbershop talk and Facebook comments and Twitter responses and that ain't right. That don't do nothing. It don't change nothing. We've got to begin to grow up in the Word of God and in the place of prayer and fasting like Daniel and learn how to war with the weapons of prayer and fasting and humility, meekness, and declaring the Word of God. It says, He who sits in the heavens. There is a divine call to the body of Christ in this hour to ascend. To ascend to the throne room of God. When we're singing about the holy, holy, and the worthy, worthy, that's more than a, that's really nice. We need to learn about that. That's a cool thing. It's absolutely mandatory for the church in this hour to get to the throne. Here's another question. My first question is, do you delight? My second question is, do you know how to ascend? Do you know how to get above the swirl? the narratives of today, and break through to the throne. Break through into that place. He who sits in the heavens. Now we're about to see the Father's perspective about the same reality. That's the most terrifying verse in the Bible is when God laughs. When God laughs. He laughs. I believe he wants to fill the church with his confidence of where this is going. It says that the Father is going to hold them in derision. He's going to speak to them in his wrath and distress them, oh my goodness, in his deep displeasure. The Father's deep displeasure. These aren't words we talk about. We don't talk about the wrath of the Father, the deep displeasure of the Father. As we see the Father who has prepared for eternity to give His Son all nations from Mount Zion. And the nations are seeking to overthrow something that has been born in the heart of God. That has been in the heart of God from eternity past. There's been something burning in the heart of God from eternity. And we see nations seeking to overthrow what's been burning in the heart. And that's to give all things to the Son of His right hand. The Father holds them, speaks to them, distresses them, and declares it to the nations. We've already voted, and you weren't in the voting process. You kings want to rule this land. I've already set my king. I've already set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I have my king, and I have my hill. You're not going to rule this. You're not going to run this. You're not going to overtake this. This is my king and my hill, and he gets it all from here. Jesus is seated right now in heavenly Zion, right now. The resurrection, the early church understood in Acts 4 that Jesus was sitting on his holy hill at the right hand of the Father. And they prayed Psalm 2, and God shook a building and sent Holy Ghost fire. But I'm here to tell you that not only is he sitting 
Friend, he is going to descend to the earth and he's going to sit on his father David's throne on this earth. He is going to be seated and he's going to rule from that land over all the nations of the earth. I have set my king on my holy hill. I love this. Kings are setting. I've already set. Kings are setting. I've already set. They're setting. They're planning. They're, pl- they're getting all together. And he goes, it's already handled. There's an eternal decree that has already been established. That no amount of principalities or powers or rulers or dominions or money or all the backing in the world can overthrow what's already been set. We need this revelation of the Father to touch the church. I love Father that embraces prodigals. I love Father that hunts you down and gives good hugs. But I love the Father that says, ha uh I love the father's zeal and his love for his son. I love the father's zeal to fulfill a word that he gave to Abraham. A word that he gave to Isaac and Jacob and David. And how God's word has held true throughout all of generations. This is about the faithfulness of his word. This is about the faithfulness of his counsel and of his word. That's what's on the line right here. We need this father in the church. I have set my king on my holy hill. I love all the mys. I love all the mys. Scene closes. The next scene opens, verses 7 through 9, and now we're going to see Jesus come to the forefront. Just a few more, few more minutes, okay? Like, man, I promise. We're talking about ready in the bride. Well, I want to get you ready for the great and terrible day of the Lord. I want to get you ready. I want to get you prepared. I want you to break through into the Bible and actually read what the Bible says. There's more in the Bible about Jesus' second coming and more about the generation of His second coming than there is even in the Gospels during His first coming. It's not a side issue. It's absolutely germane, core to the gospel. And we've got to knock off the funk, break off the deception, break off the slumber, and get our spirits alive and begin to get ourselves ready. Revelation 19, and his bride has made herself ready. How is she making herself? She's not working for it. She's working from it. And she has cooperated with the process of God's preparation of the end time church. She submitted and surrendered to the work of the Holy Spirit to confront that lying issue. And that lust issue. And that little hiding place you run to in shame and rejection. You surrender to the work of the Holy Spirit to confront all the caves on the inside of you. You surrender to the Holy Spirit to burn up all the harsh views of God and begin to tenderize your heart into a loving, compassionate father and a jealous bridegroom. You cooperated with the process. You didn't give up when he disciplined you like a good father. But you stayed there and you went through the process. She made herself ready. He's not going to do it for you. You're going to do it too. Which means you're not going to quit and you're going to agree with the process. He's coming and he's going to shake everything. It's the great and the terrible day of the Lord. Psalm 1, Psalm 2, we've got to break out of the counsel of the ungodly. We've got to break out of the path of sinners. Break out of the seat of the scornful. Peter talks about a mocking spirit in the last days that would always say, we've been hearing about his coming forever. If you heard that in your head, that's a mocking spirit. This is they willfully forget.
scene reopens, and now we're going to see Jesus in Psalm 2, verse 7. Look at this, absolutely staggering to me. These two verses have probably consumed more of the last eight years of my life than any two verses in the Bible. I will declare the decree. The decree is the Lord has set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. There's another my. Today I have begotten you. And then the father looks at Jesus and says, you see those nations raging? Ask me for them. And I'll make them your inheritance. And the ends of the earth is your possession. You will rule them with the rod of iron and dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. What is Jesus doing when chaos, confusion, and rage is breaking out in the nations? What is the church to be about when chaos, confusion, and rage is breaking out? Do we need to be in the middle of Facebook debates? Do we need to be in Twitter debates? Do we need to be having ongoing and debates? What is Jesus doing? He's in intercession. He's in intercession. What's the church to be about? Making eye contact with the Father. Come out of the swirl, church. Come out of the noise, church. Come out of the chaos, church. Come out of it. Come out. Come out of the council. Come out of the path. Come out of the seat. And make eye contact with Abba. Sorry. See, this is where intercession begins. We don't talk about intercession. We just left that for the few Loud women in a back room. Thank you, loud women. You taught me how to pray. But I'm here to tell you God's restoring intercession in this generation. Intercession is coming back to the church because it's our only way forward. Jesus forever lives to make intercession. And it's not about a personality type. It's our new creation identity. Intercessors arise. It's not a women's ministry. There's an intercessor in heaven, it's not a woman. It's a man. The very fact that we see it as a women's ministry is in our indictment. Jesus is looking at the Father, he says, I will declare the decree. Now this is the core of intercession, the Lord has said to me. Intercession doesn't begin with you talking. It doesn't begin with you marching and waving banners and anointing things with oil. It begins with you hearing something. Hearing something. Encountering something. And that's why we have nothing to talk to God about that moves Him because we haven't heard anything. This is where He's speaking. This is the very ground of intercession. God speaks and it moves our heart. We then speak the same word back to God and it moves God's heart. People ask, what moves God? God moves God. When God hears God through you, God moves. Most of us have never sat long enough to get God in us. If you abide in me and my words abide in you. Blank check. My words abide in you. You're not going to get that at an impartation service. You're going to get that by months and years and decades of a lot of boring times where you don't feel a lot. And you plow and you plow and you plow and you plow. I want that word living in me. It's going to deliver you from I need to get it quick. He don't move that way. The things that matter don't come that quick.
The Lord has said to me. There are two things the Father is declaring over the church in this hour. Number one, he declares it over the Son. He says it at his baptism. He says it at the Mount of Transfiguration. He's saying it in eternity. You are my Son. You are my Son. His ownership, his seal, his acceptance, his installment, his enthronement, his affections. And friend, if Jesus is receiving this, us who are in the Son, this is what's going to pull the church out of widowhood and out of orphanhood and out of living in the front yard of Christianity. We need a revelation of beloved identity. We need a revelation of sonship to strike the church in this hour. We're living in the front yard. And I can hear the Holy Spirit saying, kids, it's getting late. Come on in. Come into the house of prayer. Come into the house of prayer. Been living in the front yard of running away like the younger son or working real hard like the older one. You are my son. He is breaking off wrong paradigms of God. He's breaking off wrong paradigms of us. He is delivering us from the religious, harsh, disappointed view of God. And He's tenderizing us in love. The spirit of adoption is touching the church. But the spirit of adoption is crying out. It's not just giving you good hugs. It's awakening a cry. Spirit of adoption is bringing us in sonship. And I love this. When you come into the house, it's acceptance and then ceilings lift and you know inheritance. He says, ask of me, I'll, I'll give you nations as your inheritance. Why does Jesus have to ask? What does that tell you about the nature of his kingdom? What does that tell you that we have to ask? What is it about asking? I believe we're going to see a revelation of intercession touch the church like no other time. And, we're, and the Lord told me through these last eight years, the Lord used a personal story to connect me to Psalm 2. And the Lord taught me your greatest places of warfare are to become your greatest places of inheritance. I believe that God's going to release the spirit of intercession. Many of you may or may not know our story. We have three beautiful daughters. In 2012, I had a son. We named him Josiah Nash. We named him after an intercessor who used to travel with Charles Finney during the 1800s during the Second Great Awakening named Daniel Nash. He labored with Finney for seven years, went home to be with the Lord in 1831 or something like that. Finney's itinerant revival stopped shortly after that. He was an a hidden intercessor. We got marked by his life. We named him Josiah Nash, and he was with us for nine and a half months. March 16th, 2013, I'm in London, England ministering. My wife takes him to see family in Arkansas, lays him down for a nap. He doesn't wake up. I get the nightmare calls, and the last eight years have been the earth-shaking, ground-breaking, God, are we going to make it season? In the middle of it, Psalm 2 has brought more comfort to my soul in the last eight years than any chapter in the Bible. Because he taught me how to come out of the swirl, make eye contact with the Father, and lay hold of my inheritance in Christ. In 2015, I was asking God, what's my inheritance? I was locked in on every word. What's my inheritance? Inheritance, inheritance, inheritance. And it was in that season that a friend sent a dream to me. And, and my friend said a dream. He said the church was under siege, Corey, as we, everybody ran to the city square, as we realized the cultural wars were increasing, and we don't know how to pray in these days. Well, I come into the dream smiling, saying, these are the days we've been waiting on. And my friend began to prophesy over me in the dream. He said, Corey, for every one voice of awakening, I'm going to raise up seven voices of intercession. He said it again, 
For every one voice of awakening, I'm going to raise up seven voices of intercession. And then he says, I've given Lou Engel the, Na- the Nazarites, but I'm about to raise up Nasherites. And the Nasherites will be a hidden army of intercessors. They won't be known in the eyes of men, but they're going to be famous in heaven. And my friend shared this dream with me, and I said, God, give me a hundred million Nasherites. Hundred million intercessors. Over the last six years of praying through it, I'm convinced it's Isaiah 62, 6 and 7. God says, I'm going to set watchmen on the walls of Jerusalem who will not rest day or night until Jerusalem is a praise in the earth. It's what Billy was praying into tonight. I believe that God wants to release the spirit of intercession. We've got a lot of talking, and I feel like there's a lot of words that if we don't repent for, are going to be standing an accusation against us at the judgment seat. And a lot of those words were tweeted and texted and commented. Words that will live forever that Jesus calls idle words. We need a restoration of the recovery of words. A friend sent me a dream earlier this week from Psalm 12 that I'm gripped with Psalm 12. And I've just been meditating on it all week. The words of the Lord are pure words. Like silver tried in the furnace seven times. Words don't have any meaning anymore. We need to shut up for a season so we can hear again. And recover a holiness and an awesomeness of His Word. It's a great indictment on the whole system. But we need communities that are going to make room for this. We need communities that are going to fight for a restoration of the Word of God. It's priesthood unto prophet. We need priests unto prophets. I'm running this string through the whole thing, the Word of God. And I believe he wants to mark us tonight with the spirit of intercession. The words that move God are the words you heard from God. Amen. Amen. Let's stand.